They realize that everything is more profitable for the companies if you can transform everything to some form of subscription service. To this vision, we're removing from ownership to access. We're not buying things anymore. We're not buying products, we're not buying stuff. We don't buy DVDs, instead we subscribe to services like Spotify. We don't really buy software and install it and deal with the servers, instead we subscribe to things like Salesforce and Google. How far can this business model go? Can this really go to the entire economy? Let me ask you a question. How many subscriptions do you have? Probably too many to count, right? Don't worry, most people do. And there's a very good reason why. The amount of subscription service companies has exploded in the past decade. But the question is, why? It might make sense to have a gym subscription, and streaming movies is much more convenient than buying DVDs individually. But now there are companies that will sell a subscription to basically everything. You can buy a subscription to cars, shaving equipment, groceries, video games, plane tickets, and even a place to live. You can get a subscription for that. Literally every product, every digital product you could ever want, any physical thing you could ever want, there is literally a subscription service for that. BMW recently rolled out a new subscription service that lets you turn on the heated seats in the luxury car you just purchased from them. A startup here in San Francisco is offering $1,600 a month co-living subscription, which gives you walk-in to walk-out access to co-living and working spaces around the world, a service that has become a big hit with digital nomads. I don't want to make the argument that subscriptions are an evil conspiracy designed to make sure you never own anything. Ha <laughs> ha! See the triangle man? We came here for answers. I suppose there's no harm in walking you through our plan for world domination. Those of you who watch my channel regularly will know that I like to take a more level-headed approach so that you can make up your own mind. Truthfully, most of these businesses are just following what people want. A lot of these services I use myself and really enjoy. But the average person is now spending $273 a month on subscriptions, and at the same time, less than one-third of them could afford a $1,000 expense without going into debt. This is a lot of money, and this is the new form of getting money from people. So it's time to learn how money works to find out how everything became a subscription. This week's lesson was made possible by Raycon. This holiday, I was spending a lot of my time in transit and needed to keep up with my favorite podcaster, Patrick Boyle. The problem is that when you're in a loud airplane and surrounded by noisy family, trying to stay focused on what you're listening to is hard. Fortunately, I had my Raycons with me. With optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit, these earbuds are so comfortable and they will not budge. Trust me. They also offer eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. They are priced just right, giving you the quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons also come with noise isolation and awareness modes. Noise isolation allows me to block outside noise and noise awareness lets me listen to my music or podcast while also hearing what's going on around me. Upgrade your audio game this new year by purchasing yourself a pair of Raycons. Click on the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com forward slash HMW to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. The simple reason that everything has suddenly become a subscription is because investors love companies with a subscription service, especially in the tech space. The next question then is, why do investors love this business model so much? There are four reasons. Reason number one is that it makes expensive products easier to sell. If Netflix was to become a one-time purchase product, it would cost at least $2,000 for the basic ad-free plan based on discounted cash flows, which is fancy investor speak for the present value of the recurring subscription. Some other people simply call it the time value of money. Money now is worth more than money in the future because money now can be reinvested to make more money and money in the future will also be worth less thanks to inflation. By doing some math, we can work out that the value of a monthly subscription that a user keeps paying forever is worth about $2,000. You can roughly verify this because if Netflix got that money up front and was able to reinvest it in the market, they would receive a risk-adjusted return of roughly $100 per year, which is roughly how much they would make from charging a subscription. An upfront business model also has the benefit of putting the money into Netflix's account up front so they wouldn't have to worry about people canceling their subscriptions, which their average user only keeps for around 50 months. The problem is that not many people would pay $2,000 up front for Netflix, especially back when it was a new company. Today, people would still be unlikely to buy a one-time Netflix plan at that price because as an investment, it would take 20 years to pay off. 
I don't think so. It's better for everybody for the investors to take responsibility for the long-term payoff because, well, that's the reason that investors invest in the first place. Reason number two that investors love subscription businesses is that it makes business easier to operate and scale. A subscription business has consistent revenue coming in every single month, but a business that makes its money from direct sales is going to have good months and bad months. Businesses with the best economics are subscription businesses because there's this low um, you know, cost to acquire the user and then you're making money on a recurring revenue basis on that existing sunk cost. It's very hard to ramp up or ramp down expenses quickly in a company. So a few bad months that a direct sales business didn't see coming can force them to cut the expenses that they can get rid of quickly by stopping new projects and laying off staff. This can hurt morale and stop the business growth and development that would have come from those projects and workers. Single sale businesses can avoid these problems by keeping more cash on hand, but that cash is coming from investors who would prefer it to be used to grow the business. Subscription businesses still have their ups and downs, but their income is much smoother since the bulk of their revenue doesn't rely on making new sales to new customers every single time. Predictable revenue means that the company can plan their expenses further in advance and they don't need to keep lots of cash around to protect them from a bad quarter, so instead the money can be reinvested into growing the business. But above all, reoccurring sales of products or services breed familiarity, trust and routine. People are far more likely to stick with something that they just trust to do the job, even when there's a far better option available. The third reason that investors love subscriptions is because it gives businesses an ongoing relationship with a pool of customers. This one is pretty straightforward. If a customer buys something once, then a business won't be able to collect data about how they use their product or services like they would if that customer had an account that they used to access an ongoing subscription. This lets businesses tailor products based on user data and also lets them sell new services to an ongoing pool of customers if they develop a new product. The final reason that investors love subscriptions is because other investors love subscriptions. Venture capital firms are responsible for giving us most of the big subscription platforms that are slowly taking over the world today. These investors work by making early investments into companies so that they can expand their operations and acquire their first customers. A lot of these companies lose money for a very long time to grow as quickly as possible because they know their business model only works if they grow to enormous sizes. This has become to be known in the venture capital space as blitzscaling. Venture capital firms do not want to own these companies forever. They eventually want to sell them to either private equity or retail investors through an IPO so that they can raise money to invest in more new ventures to hopefully repeat the process all over again. A venture capital firm's customers are not the people buying subscriptions to the companies they invest in. Their customers are the investors that will buy their companies once they have got them to scale, and since their customer wants subscription businesses, that's what they make. Just because something works for investors doesn't mean that it's a good thing for everybody. And there are reasons that we should be worried about the subscription occasion of everything. But there are also some good things that come from it. And in the interest of having a well-rounded discussion, I want to start with those. Subscriptions are simply a great way to try a product without committing to a large purchase, which could be difficult to return. Anywhere from $100 to a few thousand or more. And that doesn't always work for your audience's budget. With a subscription, they can spread that cost across multiple months, making it easier to fit into their spending plan. If companies rely on subscription revenue, then they will need to constantly update their product so their subscribers don't just shift their subscription to a competitor. Adobe Photoshop used to be available to buy as a one-time purchase. It came on a CD, and you could pick it up at Radio Shack for about $350, which was very expensive at the time. Once you had it, that was it. You never had to pay for it ever again. But that was the version of Photoshop you would use until you went out to buy the updated copy for another $350. Today, you can't buy Photoshop directly. You can only subscribe to it. But in return, you'll get constant updates and new features for less than you would end up spending on updating the software every three years using those old CDs. And in return, Adobe gets a constant revenue stream and the opportunity to try and sell you their complete software bundle for $40 a month. But now for the reason we should be worried. The first is simply how much it ends up costing. If a one-time purchase of the most basic Netflix package would cost $2,000, then it might sound downright responsible to break this up into a $10 a month subscription. But if the alternative was purchasing content directly, then absolutely nobody would buy the entire Netflix library. Subscription services package a lot of features that you wouldn't buy outright, and they get away with it because $10 a month is a much easier purchase to make than $2,000 once. The average person is now spending nearly $300 a month on subscriptions, according to a study by Wes Monroe, a technology consulting firm. 
This number only measured technology subscriptions, so old school subscriptions like gym or club memberships would not be included in this total. At a time when a majority of people cannot afford a $1,000 expense, $300 is going to financially hurt a lot of people, perhaps without them even knowing about it. The same study found that most people underestimated how much they were spending on subscriptions by $133 a month, or around $1,500 a year, enough to more than double most people's savings. A lot of subscription services intentionally take advantage of this by intentionally limiting contact with customers that they detect are no longer using their services and hope that they will just forget about their subscription and keep on paying it without ever looking at every single last expense on their credit card at the end of the month. This has the potential to lock low-income households into a spiral of paying for subscriptions to everything they use because they never have the cash to purchase things directly. Now honestly, this is an extreme case, and most of these companies are offering a non-essential service, so at some point people do need to take responsibility for their own personal spending. Where that point is, I'll let you decide. What we may not get a choice in though, is companies pushing subscriptions into products that really don't need to be subscriptions. By now, you may have heard about BMW trying to charge its customers $18 a month to access the heated seat function in their cars in South Korea. It seems the future of cars is a subscription nightmare. The reason the company did this was that luxury car manufacturers make a lot of money from optional extras like heated seats in their cars. For high-end models, it's not unusual to add 50% or more of the car sale price into optional extras alone. The problem is that differently optioned cars are very hard to deal with on a mass production line, and it's much cheaper to manufacture cars if they are all the same. What manufacturers do to make this easier and cheaper is build all of the vehicles with heated seats and most other options installed. If the customer did not choose heated seats as an optional extra, the dealer will just deactivate the feature in the car's computer before handing over the keys. This effectively makes a feature like a heated seat a software purchase, and software is the best type of product to turn into a subscription. BMW is not alone either. Lots of other car manufacturers, including Toyota, have announced plans to introduce paid subscriptions to unlock features that are already physically installed on the car that you paid for. If car manufacturers are allowed to do this, they will, because their investors will demand that they do because of how much money there is to be made from subscription services. Some companies have even spoken about removing their products from sale and only offering them through a subscription service. This might be okay for a non-essential piece of software with lots of competitive alternatives. But if this continues to gain popularity in industries that people rely on like cars or housing, there are some nasty implications. Like, could a company ban you from your car or your house? If this has all got you a bit worried, then this next part is really important. Subscription services have probably reached their peak. Earlier this year, Netflix posted its first quarter ever with negative subscriber growth, which wiped off 50% of the company's value since the beginning of the year. You know, with uh, all of the account sharing, which we've always had, that's not a new thing. Um, but when you add that up together, we're getting pretty high market penetration. And that combined with the competition is really, you know, what we think is driving uh, the lower acquisition. Subscription businesses are going to be much less popular in a higher interest rate investing environment because when interest payments are due, it becomes more important to have money now than it does to a potential stream of money in the future. Customers are also getting smarter about tracking, managing, and canceling their subscriptions, and the third video streaming service is one of the first things to get cut when money gets tight. These companies are going to be in for a very tough time, and maybe they might start to wish they got their money up front. But even if they do fail, it won't be the worst thing, because trying to keep a sinking business afloat can cause worse outcomes for all stakeholders. To find out how, go and watch my video on why good companies should not last forever. A special thanks again to Raycon for making it possible for everybody to keep on learning how money works. Uh, well, then I'm sorry, sir. I cannot cancel your subscription as much as I want to, which is unfortunate as I'm noticing now because your annual billing payment for $349.99 is about to renew tomorrow. That's awful news, and I don't want that.